Hello and welcome to episode 314 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore of Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many other postings. How are you this December morning, Bill? I'm doing great, Seth. We'll be together down at the World War II Museum, all three of us. In just a few days, and I already alluded to the fact that we've got another guest, right? Indeed, indeed. <laughs> and we're guest. always, huh? Perhaps the same guest. <laughs> it is, it is. And we're always glad to have him. John Parshall. John, how are you this fine yeah, I'm December very morning? well. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys at the end of the week. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, coming into the holiday season, and I may even have a basement that's operable by, you know, the end of next week. I'm looking forward to that, too, before my sister-in-law a... sister show up. Oh. <laughs> Is <laughs> that a, a good little... thing? No, no, it's a good thing. It's a good okay. thing. We had a little water damage in the basement, and uh, all my books are in boxes at this point sitting out in the garage. And, yeah, it's kind of a mess down there. Yeah, that's not so, good. Yeah. Well, in, in Louisiana, we don't have basements, because if we did, we'd have a swimming pool. So there. <laughs> so <laughs> true. Yeah. All right. Well, before we get started, we want to ask you to like and subscribe to our channel as it helps everybody find our stuff. So if you haven't already done so, please do so. And if you have, we thank you very much. Uh, picking up where we left off last week, the Japanese mobile fleet under Ozawa Jizoburo had shot its bolt on June 19th, 1944, in the all-or-nothing, almighty decisive battle that the Japanese had been seeking for two years, Ozawa's newly minted carrier air groups, flying from the decks of Taiho, Shokaku, Zuikako, Chitose, Zuiho, Junyo, and others, flew with the hopes of their empire oh so very tentatively balanced on their wings. Those Japanese naval aviators and others flying from land-based strips in and around the Marianas flew quite literally into an American buzzsaw, the likes of which the Japanese could never have imagined prior to June 19th. In the air battle that took place, the American Hellcats flying from the decks of 15 American aircraft carriers of Task Force 58 absolutely annihilated the Japanese attackers. In a series of four raids, American fighter pilots and American shipboard AAA shot down over 350 Japanese aircraft, of which 243 were carrier aircraft, the remainder land-based, to the loss of only 29 American aircraft. With the slaughter absolute, Vice Admiral Mark Mitcher at the helm of the Fast Carrier Task Force sought and received permission from Admiral Raymond Spruance to pursue the retreating Japanese fleet. Adding to the injury, the submarine USS Albacore had sunk the pride of the Japanese carrier fleet Taiho earlier in the day, and Kavala had sunk Pearl Harbor veteran Shokaku later in the day. So the Japanese fleet had theoretically been defanged but had lo and had lost two of its major aircraft platforms. Knowing he had to pour the coal on to catch the distant enemy, Mitcher opened the throttles on his carriers and gave chase. The Big Blue Fleet ran all night long in an effort to catch Ozawa at the furthest extent of the American carrier's range setting up the last day of the Battle of the Philippine Sea's action, which would be both heroic and chaotic and would eventually be called by historians like us, the mission beyond darkness. Gentlemen, this is, uh, whereas the turkey shoot was a, you know, a furball, a, a, a highly successful furball, at least from our American standpoint, this is a very um, stressful <laughs> day in the lives of the american aviators that are going to fly this mission and the guys aboard the ships this is this is truly one of those missions that we talk about you know when we talk about the history of the pacific war that is it stands out above a lot of other ones because of the stuff that goes down here and some of the things that don't go down here and we'll, we'll get into that as we get through the episode but um you know one thing we left off with last week is that you know Mark Mitchell wanted to attack the Japanese. You know, he wanted to go out there and just hit them right in the face, but he had to find them and he hadn't found them. And that's kind of where we're still sitting now. He knows roughly the general vicinity of where they are, but he has not located. Nobody's ever actually set eyes on the Japanese fleet. So there's really, there's a lot, it's not, you know, not unlike Midway and that there's a lot of searching and hunting that they got to do to, and to, to find these uh, Japanese carriers. And that's exactly what they're doing first thing in the morning. Right. 
Yeah, we really have sort of an inverse of of Midway here in that our scouting at that battle was uh, really pretty darn good. And we obviously, you know, got the drop on the Japanese because we found them first. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the exact opposite here. And in fact, you know, even after a full day worth of battle, we still don't know where the Japanese carriers are. So, yeah, you know, up go. Um, multiple teams, seven different uh, scouting teams go up in the morning to go out looking for the Japanese to see if we can localize them because, you know, putting the pedal to the metal and and moving uh, west with all due speed isn't going to do us any good unless we can actually find these guys. Exactly, exactly. And Enterprise is one of the carriers that sends out some night searches and they come up, you know, with an empty Empty. bag as does, as does everybody, you know, through a good bit of the morning and they're, they're hunting and pecking and they're not finding anything. So So, I got a question, John, um, you know, the the senior leadership makeup here is the same as in Midway, right? With, uh, you know, Sprintz was what, a two-star at the time and and Mitchell was an 06 carrier CO enterprise and, yeah, um, you know, but the dynamic had changed because, you know, Spruance was embarked in Enterprise then, and now he's Hornet. not. He was in Hornet. And, yeah. Know, oh, I'm sorry, is, you're right. Yeah, you're Mitch Hornet. was in Hornet. Yep. Of course, you're right. Yeah. So <laughs> I wonder to, to what extent, you know, that dynamic of, you know, we can finish what we started at Midway with it, these two humans, right? These two individuals. Um, had any effect on this battle? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, 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 I'm pretty sure, though, that some of the detritus from Midway is still shaping the relationship between these two gentlemen. Um, mm-hmm. You know, after, after that battle, Mitcher, uh, in his own words, got shelled. You know, he got put out mm-hmm. to pasture running a running the patrol wing up at Kaneohe, uh, and he didn't hold a carrier assignment for the next year and a half. And a large part of that is due to the fact, of course, that Spruance was telling Nimitz, and and Nimitz probably told King, uh, that, you know, Mitchard gun-decked his report, and, uh, it's, you know, he lied about what went down on, yeah. on Hornet. So my sense is that, you know, Mitcher obviously is is the man in charge now, but Spruance has a long memory for those sorts of things. And, and I, you know, I, I really kind of wonder at a fundamental level just how much respect Spruance had for Mitcher. I'm not sure about that. He had to have a lot because he gave him a lot of autonomy here. Yeah. May, you know, yeah. Maybe it was forced respect, but, you know, I don't, yeah, I agree with you. I don't think he, trusted Mitchell right. after Midway. And yeah. now he's kind of here and he gives, you know, he doesn't, we're going to talk about when he yanks on the reins in a bit, you know, but. Which he um, did on the 19th. I mean, he held, you know, holds him in very close check. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Anyway, it's interesting. Yeah. The leadership that, that I wonder about. Yeah, no, there's, there's definitely some subtext there. I think we can say mm-hmm. that anyway. Ozawa, for, for for those who are wondering where the hell he was, he was exactly, he was roughly some 460 miles away from west of Guam at this point-ish, um, heading on a heading pointing northwest. In other words, he's he's trying to get out of the way. But John, you made a point is that he was not necessarily running. He still wanted to seek battle because yeah. the numbers on the, well, the losses, that he had sustained on the day previous, June nineteenth, the Turkey shoot, were not exactly one hundred percent clear to him at that time. That's right, and in, in a certain respect, they're not as, I mean, they're awful, but they're not uh, annihilating in in the way that we often think of them. So, uh, just just running the napkin math here, he brought four hundred and thirty five carrier aircraft to the fight. He uh, put up 373 of those planes on strike missions the previous day, which says that roughly 60 were sitting back uh, as reserves, either in scout or combat air patrol activities. So he sends up 373 planes, 243 of them are destroyed, but 
you know, 130 come back to the carriers, which means mm -hmm. that in combination with those cap aircraft and whatnot, he still has over 200 aircraft, theoretically. Now, some of those may have been damaged. Um, we know, too, that when some of those planes came back, uh, you know, Shokaku by this time was visibly on fire. And so a lot of those aircraft are thinking, you know, I don't want to land on her. And they end up landing on either Taiho or Zuikaku. Taiho, of course, if you land on Taiho, that's a plane that's yeah, going to go down with that ship. And some of them, some of the of those 60 aircraft that were in reserve were undoubtedly on Shokaku and went down with her too. But the bottom line is this. I had a, a pretty in-depth email discussion with Barrett Tillman, Rich Frank, John Lundstrom, Jim Sarek, and Chuck Haberline on this whole topic of, you know, how many aviator losses were there on the Japanese? What do the plane losses look like? And it's real, real murky. Um, Jim Sawruck knows the Japanese air group records better than anybody on the planet. And even with him in the mix, you know, I don't know how many planes exactly Ozawa has got to his name on the morning of the 20th. The other issue is that when Ozawa um, gets off of Taiho, when he abandons her, he first gets on the destroyer Wakatsuki and then transfers his flag to heavy cruiser Haguro which incidentally is the very first uh, 1700 waterline kit I ever built as a kid. This was the gateway drug that sucked me into the IGN. <laughs> um, gateway drug. <laughs> it's the gateway drug. Um, and so he's on Haguro, and she does not have adequate communications facilities to serve as flagship. And so Ozawa is in the dark as to what his real losses are. And it's not until around lunchtime on the 20th, at 1202, Haguro pulls alongside Zui Kaku. He gets back aboard the one remaining fully functional fleet carrier he's got. And it's only then that he becomes aware that, oh my God, the losses yesterday were catastrophic. He still thinks he's got a fair number of those planes that are missing, maybe on Guam, Rota, and Saipan. Right. And he still thinks that Kakuta's air, air forces remain significant in number. So his basic game plan on the 20th is, okay, we're going to regroup and refuel. We're going to reconstitute our forces and get this rodeo back together so that on the 21st, we can re-engage the Americans in a second round of battle. So the net-net is Ozawa has not given up yet. And that's exactly what he does or he tries to do in the beginning of that day on, on the 20th. At 0800, he starts pulling A and B force north to link up with C force and the two oiler groups to refuel. They do need to refuel. Yep. Um, he finally, as you said, he gets his people together around noon. And and it's what is it? It's about 1300, I think, when he stops refueling and sends the oilers away. Ish. Yeah, that's right. Um, because what ends up happening is the Vanguard force, which is moving towards him, but is still, you know, somewhat to the east of his two main carrier groups. That Vanguard force sights uh, American reconnaissance planes and the cruiser Otago sends a report to Ozawa saying uh, we've been spotted, at which point Ozawa thinks to himself, they're coming for me, which is exactly right. So he, at that point, tells his oilers, stop oiling, uh, let's get out of Dodge here, and starts moving uh, off to the northwest. It's unclear to me whether or not he still, whether he's given up on this notion of re-engaging on the 21st, but he knows that, at the very least, he cannot be doing low-speed refueling operations, because if you're refueling from an oiler, you're probably... You know, the Japanese and the Americans were different in how they, they did that. They did do alongside um, refueling, but they're probably only moving eight to ten knots. That's not good when you've got an enemy carrier force that is, you know, breathing down your neck and trying to close the gap. Closing the gap, indeed. Uh, some 340 miles astern of Ozawa is Task Force 58. They kept sending out searches all day long to find Ozawa, and as yet, had not seen him to your point exactly they'd seen some japanese carrier or japanese aircraft but they had not seen the carriers yet uh knowing that his responsibility and this is where your short leash comes into play here bill with spruance knowing that his responsibility was to protect the saipan invasion and not hunt enemy carriers 
Spruance sent, as I put it in the notes, a polite but not so muddy or murky message to Mitcher, and it read like this, quote, desire to push our searches today far to westward if possible. If no contact with enemy fleet results, consider indication fleet is withdrawing and a further pursuit after today will be unprofitable. If you concur, which is nice, retire tonight towards Saipan, unquote. <laughs> if you concur and you will. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and, and Mitcher, Bill, this this goes exactly to what you were saying. Mitcher could read between the lines. I don't know if it's necessarily a mistrust thing, but Spruance also knows that his job is to protect this invasion fleet or not the invasion, fleet, the, the, the beaches back here, yeah. uh, the beachhead and, and not go hunting enemy carriers. Nowhere in his orders that it say you will destroy the Japanese fleet. Nothing like That's that right. comes out there. So Mitcher can read between the lines here and he knows he's on a short timetable, though, right? Bill. Yeah. Yeah, he does. <laughs> yeah. I love it when that happens. <laughs> yeah. So Spruance has got the strategic objective in mind. And, you know, these aviators, I'm going to say it that way. Is it okay if I say it that way? These aviators, they keep wanting to chase these carriers all over the Pacific. And this is going to happen again, right at Leyte. We're going to talk about that. And and I wonder, again, this won't be too much of a spoiler alert. Most of our listeners, listeners know exactly what happened at Leyte. I wonder if Mitcher and Halsey had a post-battle conversation about this that might have resulted in something similar happening at yeah. Leyte. But anyway, at this point, Spruance is still in charge. Halsey doesn't get command. For, for a bit, right? And and um, Spoons ain't gonna let it happen. No, no. And, and, and Mitchell also knows too that, I mean, just doing the math in the terms of, you know, sunset, he knows that if he roughly, if his people don't find something by about 1600, the, the jig is up. He's gonna have to turn around and he's gonna have to go back towards Saipan because he's not gonna launch more searches into the dark and let, you know, his carriers keep running all night long to find something that might not be there. Well, and the other thing to keep in mind here, too, is, uh, you know, I don't know what the speed of advance of this force is, at least 24 knots, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, maybe faster. You know, the carriers can do that for quite a long time. Uh, the destroyers, the destroyers are just sucking gas down at this point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah it, it's funny. If you look at the fuel consumption uh, curbs for, for a destroyer at high speed, you know, um, it's, it's one of those... <laughs> asymptotic kind of you know up it goes you know as you increase the throttles speed to the third power I teach yeah exactly it just it just goes through the roof so yeah. you, you have to be mindful of the fact that the longer you push this pursuit uh your escorts are not going to be in as good a position to defend you against another air attack or submarine attack for that matter either particularly air attack if they're starting to run low on gas yeah. Exactly. And they were starting to run low on gas, they being the destroyers. And they weren't at a critical level yet, but if they kept running at that high speed, and I believe, I think you're right, I think Task Force 58 was running somewhere between 24 and 20, 28 knots because they were going as fast as the battleships could go. And I think South Dakota right. could make 28 going downhill. Yeah, I mean, so, you yeah. know, You'd probably yeah. doing 20, 26, something like that. Yeah, would be. Somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah. But they were starting to, the needles were starting to inch a little bit closer towards E, as we'll, right. as we'll say. So while the morning search was still looking for Japanese ships, USS Lexington's air group commander, a guy named Colonel, Cor Colonel, Commander Ernie Snowden, hatched an idea. A dozen Hellcats would fly with an Avenger. And as Barrett Tillman put it in his fantastic book, by the way, which is probably the definitive account of this entire event, um, a butt numbing 475 miles. And that that is that is a very polite way to put a 470 mile flight in a Hellcat and an Avenger. Um, this is about 150 miles beyond the supposed maximum range. And these things are fitted. You had a question. These things are fitted with extra fuel. You know, they're they're out there just trying to hunt whatever they can find. Um he receives Mitchell's approval for the launch. Snowden and his volunteers launch. They flew the search to no avail. Yet, even on that long stretch, they don't find anything either. On their way back to the fleet, however, because you got to remember, Task Force 58's got fingers all over the air. 
They're going there. I mean, they're literally looking all over the place on their way back. Snowden hears a garbled message and it sounds like somebody did indeed find something um, flying high above the sea in an Avenger from Enterprise. My boys, uh, Torpedo Squadron 10, Lieutenant Robert Nelson saw an aircraft, enemy aircraft flying on a reciprocal heading. Roughly 30 minutes later at 1538, remember what I said by 1600, that if they don't find anything, this is about mm. as close as it's going to get. Nelson noticed something on the horizon in between rain squalls. Nelson saw a sight that no American aviator had seen in two years, a Japanese carrier fleet. Yep. That had to light up the scoreboard inside USS Lexington when he sends that contact message. Bill, take us through some of this some of the following issues that go on through here. Well, you know, it starts with Nelson's first message where he says enemy fleet sighted, and he gives the latitude and longitude 15 degrees north, 135, 24 west, course 270, speed 20 knots. Other enterprise aircraft sent similar messages, some with some with one degree of variation. Now, now keep in mind, one degree doesn't sound like a lot, but it, but is, it is a lot at these ranges. Um, you know, I used to have these tables memorized. I'm not going to try to do math in public, but let me tell you, we're talking <laughs> dozens of miles of difference with one degree variation. And the problem with that is, again, these guys are using wind triangles for navigation to the intercept point. So it just shows you how difficult it was even to navigate in a World War II airplane, let alone get off an accurate sighting report. Uh, and John, you, you thought that uh, in the scouting and strike department, the Navy was actually a little bit rusty at this point. Yeah, I do kind of wonder about that um, I, because I'll when we get to the actual results of the strike itself, um, you know, I yeah, it, it's yes, <laughs> these guys have been hitting land bases for the last year or so. And they uh, yeah, we haven't fought a naval battle at this point since um, since. Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's, you know, that's, that's been a while. It's, we're pushing up on two years now where we've actually been in a stand up carrier fight. And so, you know, it seems sort of weird. We're really good at fleet air defense, obviously, but, you know, our, our strike stuff is still kind of rusty and our, you know, our spotting and scouting hasn't been super great here either. But mm -hmm. at least, we have a data point at this point. We've seen some Japanese carriers. We know roughly where they are. Unfortunately, yeah. that little one degree variation um, in in Nelson's sighting report it equates to about 60 miles worth of extra yeah. distance. Yeah. And then that's going to come to be a bugaboo for that's a problem. A couple, yeah. For a lot of squadrons that and we'll get to that point in the story here in a minute. So aboard Lexington, Arlie Burke, who is Mitchell's chief of staff heard Nelson's report come through the message initial message was garbled and unclear of course it is because you know we've been waiting for this all damn day uh Burke later said quote it was clear that someone had cited something but where what or who could not be determined from the first transmission Nelson kind of is like mm, we're kind of far out here you know what that might not have gone through as clear as I thought it may have so he sends another message good thinking on his part yeah, for sure, for sure. And he's orbiting, he, well, I say orbiting, he's he's trailing the Japanese. <clears throat> yeah. And he does indeed fire off another message. So uh, on board Lexington, uh, Bill, there's a there's a gaggle of people here. We talk, you know, obviously there's Mitcher. He's, he's, this is his flagship. Arlie Burke's with him. There's another guy we talked about at the Battle of Santa Cruz um, named Gus Widhelm. Gus Widhelm's there too. Uh, tell us about what's going on when, when, all these things start to come in and they're actually starting to formulate what's going to happen here. He runs to a plotting table, which is, you know, from, heck, I used to operate those things. And he worked out the equation. It's not complex as long as you've got a good datum. But and after several minutes, he noticed Mitcher staring at him intently with Arlie Burke, by the way, the surface guy should be good at this too, looking yeah. over his shoulder. Finally, Will Widhelm says to Mitcher, we can make it, but it's going to be tight. And Mitchell looks over at Burke. Their eyes meet, and he doesn't hesitate. He simply says, launch him. This is one of the more intriguing decisions. And and I, I and I'd like I'd like for us to kind of riff on this for a second because 
this is, you know, Mitcher, we said in the Turkey shoot episode that he's basically a lower, a lower ranked version of Halsey and that he is just, let's just hit him and hit him right now. Yeah. And his decision to launch here is not necessarily surprising. However, Mitcher was in love with his aviators. Like he absolutely adored these guys and they adored him too. And he had to know, actually he did know that a lot of these guys, they might make it out to the fleet, but they ain't coming home. And, and, and I want to, I mean, what do you guys think? I mean, this is a huge decision. He's risking a lot of lives on something that he, it's a 50, 50 gamble that they're either a going to find him a B half of them even make it home. And yet he still feels the need that this is a historic moment. I got to grab this because I might not see these guys again. And I'm not saying Mitchell's out for personal glory. I'm not saying that at all. I just think he's, he's seizing the opportunity, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting decision made by a guy who thinks so highly of his men. I just feel, I I feel like this response is just kind of automatic on his Mm -hmm. part, that this is culturally congruent. Understand too, that he's got a bunch of, fire breathing underlings and guys like Jocko Clark, how is he ever going to show up in front of Jocko Clark again, you know, and, right. and say, yeah, well, it, we could have maybe should have done it, but you know, it didn't look like it was, it looked like it was a little too far away. I mean, I, I, I think it's at a certain point you get into decisions that, and we talk about them in terms of individual decisions, but again, this is really, there's a cultural bias here, I think, on the part of this entire community. If we have even a shadow of a prayer of being able to hit these guys, we're going to do it. And, you know, casual, I don't want to say casualties be damned, but carrier aviation is an inherently dangerous occupation and you know all of these guys kind of knew that when they signed up for it and Mm -hmm. and the other thing that's in our back pocket that we that we know that we are very very good at is search and rescue um we've really got that down at this point we really honed that capability throughout all of the campaign in the solomons um and these aviators understand that even if they do go in the drink we're going to do everything on, you know, under the sun to try to bring them home using submarines and and you know amphibians like, uh, you know, off of the off of the the cruisers and what have you. There's going to be a lot yeah. of birds out here looking for these guys, and that gives them at least a little bit of a safety blanket. That even if I do take off and go in the drink, I've still got decent odds of being pulled out of that water. Yeah, I also think that um, there's he's feeling a little bit bulletproof after the turkey shoot right and and i know this is air to surface not air to air and all of that but but i think he felt like the capability differential after two years is real and you know to some extent i would say if he hadn't succeeded so what so surprisingly well during the turkey shoot maybe he'd be a little bit more circumspect about this aspect because the most dangerous thing about what happen right now is the night is yeah. the dark yeah and for sure. you, know, you have to deal with a lot of that up right. until this point the no, only question is how they're going to do go ahead no i was going to say I, i'd never thought about it that way before but yeah you, I, I think you're right that if it hadn't been such a walk over the previous day if one of our carriers had been sunk or at least badly yeah. damaged maybe that gives them a little bit of a, Pause, of, a, of a check yeah i don't know but you're yeah, right. Not, I mean, at this at this point, you know, the two most dangerous enemies, as far as he's concerned, are the dark and fuel. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and to be clear, I'm not questioning his decision. I just, you know, I, I just I find it interesting that someone who who was so it, it, like I said, in love with his men that that he just instantly pulled the trigger. And I think you're right. I, I think a lot of it was that, you know, he hadn't seen a Japanese carrier. Well, not he, but his, his fleet hadn't seen a Japanese carrier force in two years. And they'd been hunting these guys and hoping these guys had come out for the last two damn years. And then when they mm-hmm. finally do, he's like, he, I, he didn't have any other choice, but to launch. Yeah. yeah and I, I'm going to question his decision in 2020 hindsight later in the episode, but right. knowing what he knows at this point, I think most of the admirals would have made the same call. Sure, sure. No, I agree. I agree. So the flight out, we're talking about the distance and the dark and everything. The flight out to the mobile fleet would be at the extent, and I do mean the extent, of the Americans' range. 
At that point, the Japanese reported to be two, were reported to be 275 miles away from Task Force 58-ish. If the Japanese stayed their current course and speed, the American aircraft, if they found the fleet, which is, again, it's a big if, if yeah. they found the fleet would have one chance to run in, make an attack, and a great many of them would not theoretically have the fuel to return all the way back to the American carriers. Uh, they were given explicit orders that unless they are attacked, there are no, there are not to be any high speed maneuvers, no dogfighting, none of this malarkey over the Japanese fleet. You get in, you do your business, and you get the hell out. Yeah. Do not sit there and piddle around. Of course, there are dogfights that do uh, blossom, but yeah. I mean that you know can't be helped in some cases. Yeah, it's the nature of the beast, right? So. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so the American aircraft uh, would have very. And it's interesting to think about this for a second, and we're going to see this throughout the night. In that, you know, there's three American or four types of American aircraft that are launched out here: it's the Hellcat, the Hell Diver, the Dauntless, and the Avenger. And of all planes, you would think would use the most fuel, it would probably be the Hellcat because it's kind of like driving a sports car. You know, it's going to be you're going to get a, a really bad MVG rating on a Hellcat. But mm -hmm. surprisingly enough, more often than not, they're the ones that actually have the most fuel when these guys get back at night. So it's it's kind of an interesting. interesting. Yeah. yeah, it really is. Yeah, it's it's, it's different. Um, with all that staring him in the face, Mitcher absolutely, like like we said, he had no choice. He had to launch his airmen. I he does that very thing. He felt that the Japanese fleet were escaping. Um, the pilots, and this we're going to talk about my old friend Jig Dog Ramage here, uh, with the original plot of 230 miles, it looked like a stretch. It was doable, but it was going to be a stretch aboard Enterprise, VB-10's commanding officer, Jig Dog Ramage, looked at the plot and told his men we're going to be gas misers, unquote, which is, which is very, very, very true. Uh, you got to remember, too, that um, Jig and uh, a gentleman that we're going to talk about, too, a guy named Ralph Weymouth, uh, they were flying SPDs. Every other dive bomber squadron in the fleet were flying Hell Divers, but VB-16 aboard Lexington and VB-10 aboard Enterprise were flying SPDs. So they were yeah. going to have the theoretically the shortest legs of, and it's interesting how this all pans out, but, and we'll get to that, but they were yeah. theoretically had the shortest legs of any airplane flying out there. So they were going to have to, you know, lean mixture it the whole way out there be very very touchy on yeah what your what your uh prop angle is going to be and all of that yes. stuff it is yeah. funny yeah these are the last two squadrons flying the sbd because they just hated the hell diver like holy hell <laughs> they were like mm -hmm. they'd be goddamn if they were gonna you know take that plane on and so they're still flying the dauntless and there, and we'll we'll get to this at the end of this episode but there was actually according to jig when he told me this there was actually conversation of re instituting the sbd back into the fleet after phil c and we'll talk oh, about why that. yeah, yeah, yeah. At yeah. Least that's what he told me anyway and i'm, I'm believing so mm -hmm. back aboard lexington our uh our hero from last episode alex brashu he had just come off of alert when he gets to literally he'd gone back down to his quarters when he gets the call to get back into the red room he's like god damn it he goes back up in there and he is given the coordinates he's going to be launched as well with uh, the rest of Lexington strike, he's going to be escort here uh, at 1624. And John, this is interesting. And we'll talk about this briefly here. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. At 1624, Air Group 16 hits the flight deck for the launch, turning into the wind, which is away from the Japanese, by the way. It took Lexington only 12 minutes to launch her first strike of 11 Hellcats, 7 Avengers, and 15 SBDs. Contrast that with what we were doing at Midway. 1942, I can tell you that much. Yeah. yeah, we actually know what we're doing here. Um, it doesn't hurt that the Essex class carriers have also got a deck edge uh, lift that, you know, helps speed up the sure. launch cycles, too, if you've got to bring anything up. But you'll notice, too, that the the size of that uh, that package there that they've got, what is that? You know, a grand total of uh, 33 aircraft, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful little deck load strike. You know, this is exactly the same thing that the Japanese were doing at the beginning of the war. You only put up the number of aircraft on your flight deck that you can launch in one cycle, and that's the package that goes off. And they, they go off as a cohesive unit and off to the target they go. So, you know, it's only taken us two plus years, but by gummy, we can, you know, we can get our strikes up and off our decks here because, uh, particularly given the the extended range of this engagement we cannot afford to be steaming away from the japanese for any length of time whatsoever you know get these planes up and then we're going to turn back around and and you know the ships are going to be following after our aircraft as 
fast as the little feet can scamper because, yeah, we need to be closing the distance here. Big time. In less than 20 minutes, Task Force 58 launches 240 aircraft, 95 Hellcats. Yeah, I mean, that's getting it. That's, 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 that's getting it done, yeah. Yeah. 95 Hellcats, some are armed with 500-pound bombs, 54 Avengers, and I find this to be odd here. Of but I'll tell you why. Of which only twenty one were armed with torpedoes and seventy seven dive bombers, fifty one hell divers, and twenty six SPDs. So you would think if you got a torpedo bomber, why the hell wouldn't you look? At it and you're going to kill ships. Why would right. you not put fish in these freaking torpedo bombers? Yeah, because it took too damn long to load. It's a simple. That's yeah. That's the exact way. Some of these aircraft had already been loaded. Some of these Avengers have been loaded like earlier in the day and other ones hadn't been loaded at all because they frankly didn't expect that they were going to find anything. Mm. When they got the call, bombs load faster than torpedoes. Apparently, Yeah, right. That's that's what it said. I would be interested to see because the torpedo has more aerodynamic drag um, to what extent the the, the planes and torpedoes. Internal bombing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. No, that says to me, that's just sloppy. All of those... Well, okay. You don't want armed planes down in your hangar deck, obviously, because you never know, you know, what the gods of war may throw at you in terms of a surprise strike by the Japanese. But at the very least, I could have had those puppies uh, armed with torpedoes and sitting on my flight deck. And if I know there's an incoming raid, I just shove them over the side. Um, So, yeah, to, to me, the fact that less than half of those Avengers actually have torpedoes on them, that's that's practically criminal. So it is. It Again, is, and, and we're going to see that, the results of this. Yeah, that speaks to the rustiness of this force, perhaps. I don't know, but yeah. Anyway, I don't anyway. know. I don't know. All Another right. question: um, the 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 hell, sorry, the, the Hellcats that are carrying bombs. I mean, I guess do they have enough attachment points that they carry a drop tank and bombs. You know, that's a damn good question. I really don't. Not know. enough of an aircraft we need to really be able to answer that yeah. question. I'm sure there are yeah, plenty I mean, of our our audience is going to say partial hell can you not know that anybody knows that you know but and i don't so well, they yeah. school occasionally as well so yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, i honest to god I, I i i don't know i don't know so as as they're going as these guys are winging their way towards the japanese fleet mitcher sends a message to his aviators quote that says give them hell boys wish i was with you so is Bill, that legit? <laughs> I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Wish I was with you in your plane that may or may not make it back, but I <laughs> yeah. I should not be casting aspersions on Mitch's personal bravery. That's unkind. So yeah. Bill, let's talk about this. I mean, you you have navigated many a ship through the seas. Let it let's yeah. talk about this course deviation that is indeed about to befall these American aviators as they are already on the wing. Talk about this. And by the way, I've also navigated a handful of airplanes over the seas, but that's oh, another story. <laughs> yeah, while the distance was of concern to the pilots, the main thing that stuck in their mind was the fact that they would be landing back aboard the carriers at night. Very few of these pilots had practiced night landings. And I will tell you, every aircraft carrier pilot to this day will tell them he's more afraid of a night landing on the aircraft carrier than he is of combat. Right. And these guys were no different. Landing on a straight deck carrier at, at daylight was a serious trick. To do it at night, when the vast majority of them had never done it before, yeah, would be close to miraculous. Now, yeah. to to be some, to be clear, some of them did have experience, but most mm-hmm. didn't, and no one ever expect, expected to launch a strike that late in the day, and to recover at night. It was a huge risk, and I'm wondering if some of them didn't start questioning Mitcher's decision here as they realize what they're going to be up against. And so, uh, you know, Seth, this is a big deal. Yeah, this is huge, and it, and it gets worse because while the first strike is outbound, Mitcher had actually planned two strikes. He'd actually plan to launch two strikes. And while that first strike was outbound, the second strike is being ready. So they're bringing them up on the flight deck. They're getting them ready to go. Actually, guys are sitting in the birds. They're ready to go. A new guy named Red Carmody, who was going to lead a, one of the second strikes. And he's sitting there, engine running, ready to go. And then he gets a call, kill it. 
and they shut the birds down and they go back into the ready room. And one of the main reasons that he hesitated, that Mitcher hesitated and eventually did not launch is because they get another sighting report that Arlie Burke noted the course was one degree off, as we said, yeah. of the first reported sighting. That one degree equated to 60 miles deviation in course, pushing the limits of the already soon to be fuel starved birds another 60 miles. <clears throat> My Yikes. old buddy Jig. Yeah. I mean, that's serious. That's Yikes. serious. It's not six miles. No. 60 miles. Six zero. Yeah. 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 And you're already in the air. This is, yes. This is a bad feeling. Yeah. And you're already so puckering I mean, because you know it's going to be tight, you know. It means they're not going to be going 230 miles. They're going to be going 300 miles. Ish. Yeah. Or so. Yeah. Ish. Yeah. 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 Um, oh. Jig Ramage, uh, my, my buddy, was calculating the mileage, and he came up with a grim answer. I remember him telling me, and he quote, exactly, that one degree put the enemy 300 miles out from him, from his squadron. I knew then that it would be too tight, probably a one-way mission for us. Yeah, because it's, out, it's out and back. I mean, that's yeah, the thing. Yes. It's, it's tacking yes. on 120 miles, and even, even given the fact that your own carriers are coming up behind you as fast as they can beat feet, yeah, yes. that, that is just added probably a hundred miles to your, your total distance. And that's, that's bad news. <laughs> really bad that news. Is. His sense yeah, of you've... humor was great though. He said, uh, he told me, so somebody was going to take a bath tonight and it would likely be us. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And pretty good euphemism for ditching or going in the drink. Yeah. 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 So he signals his flock behind him. They cut, he cuts his speed. Not, you know, I mean, he's not stall speed or anything stupid like that, but I mean, he is cruising at the slowest speed that he can possibly cruise. Yeah. Uh, and he evens out his fuel. He starts to, you know, cut the mixture down even leaner. And the rest of the strike is just pulling away from him. And he notices too that Ralph Weymouth, uh, VB 16 is doing the same thing. They're, they're, you know, he clearly, they got the message too. Yeah. Um, the other thing that you end up playing is all these games between, okay, it costs me fuel to climb, but if I can get to higher altitude, I get better efficiency at that altitude. And so there's all sorts of trade-offs here that they're making mentally around, okay, is it worth it to spend that extra gasoline to get up another four or 5,000 feet where I'll have a more economical cruise to the target? And I'm sure that a lot of these groups all come up with different answers to that equation as they're going through it. 100% right. And they do. Because because you if you look at some of the strike groups from different carriers, some of them, the dive bombers are coming in at 18,000. Some of them are coming in 14. Some of them are coming at 12. Hell, there's one that comes in at 10. Right. You know, so I mean, they're, they're literally all over and the squadron commanders of the guy or at the very least. The, the, We're making the, those uh, decisions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's quite model dependent. So it's good. The answer is going to be different depending on what kind of airplane you're flying. Yeah, and you're low. Right. Good mm -hmm. point. Yeah, yeah. good point. Yeah. So roughly two and a half hours after the Americans leave the flight decks, the wakes of ships appear below the American aircraft. However, it is not Ozawa's fleet. It is the oilers that he had detached from the fleet and um, the earlier thing, in that day. Yeah, oilers, uh, <laughs> the oilers, of course, are feeling sad because they do not have the capability to run away at 24 knots from the Americans. Mm -hmm. Most of these ships are 14 to 16 at best. And so as the day has gone on, they have fallen further and further behind the comforting bosom of the anti-aircraft support that would have been with the main uh, the main fleet. So, yeah, here are the Oilers uh, with a couple of destroyers around them, and that's all they got. Mm -hmm. it, as they're passing or they're coming up on the Oilers, Ramage notices that there is a, a Helldiver squadron forming up over these Oilers. It's very evident that they're going to attack these oilers yeah. and i'm not going to mention gen the gentleman's name you can look it up if you want to it, it's there breaking radio silence ramage called in the clear which by the way his call sign his call name for this strike was 41 sniper which is probably the coolest call that's sign beautiful of, yeah. i know i yeah. 41 sniper that's yeah that's badass. that's the kind of name you want to, if you're playing overwatch or something i want to be 41 sniper <laughs> i know it's freaking cool yeah. he says unknown strike leader from 41 sniper the charlie victors he's talking about cvs, CVs. are dead ahead what are you trying to do sink their merchant marine that's brutal yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and these these guys from wasp they do attack these oilers and they wind up putting a licking on them they sink what two john i think yeah i think that's right yes and and, you know, the guy comes back afterwards and says, 
we were low on fuel. And, Mm -hmm. you know, if, if the guy on the spot knows what his fuel situation is and realizes I can't make it another 30 miles out and 30 miles back or whatever it is to hit, hit those carriers, I have an opportunity here to do some sort of damage to the Japanese. Uh, Something is better than nothing. And understand, too, that at this point in the war, of course, the Japanese are running terribly short on oilers and you have to have them to support your carrier fleet. So, um, you know, subtracting a couple oilers from the Japanese inventory is not necessarily an insubstantial contribution to the war effort. It's just not as glorious as as getting a licking in on one of the carriers. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Submarines were doing it all the time. They thought it was pretty glorious. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's <laughs> always a true. good time. They burn yeah. so nicely. Anyway. Yeah. They do. yeah. Kaboom. Kaboom. Yeah, later, later Wasp's CAG uh, responded to the criticism that was coming in from all over the place. And he said, to your point exactly, he says, quote, we were low on fuel. Jig Ramage told me, he said he retorted, well, who the hell wasn't? Yeah, you know, so I mean, you know, you got a point there. Yeah. So flying close to three hours, uh, the American strikers arrive finally over the mobile fleet. And the mobile fleet, John, and I'm gonna let you get into this. It's but they're they're scattered all to hell and breakfast. I mean they've they've yeah, conglomerated, and, but they're kind of scattered out though. Right. And if you see some of the photographs from this battle too, you notice the same thing, that there are not all that many ships within any individual photograph. Some of this is driven by the fact that even at this point in the war, uh, Japanese anti-aircraft doctrine, so far as I know, is still oriented primarily around the notion of you maneuver like hell and that's how you avoid damage. Um, So they still don't have these sort of tight ring formations around the carrier in the way that we would would do that. Some of this is also driven by the fact that Japanese anti-aircraft armament just ain't all that great. And so the carriers themselves probably pack as much firepower as, as any of the other ships that are around them. Uh, the destroyers, other than some of the anti-aircraft destroyers like the Akazuki class, Uh, really aren't going to be able to contribute all that much. They can barely take care of themselves. So the result is that, yes, this fleet has still not fully coalesced. uh, And some of them, as we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, are doing independent maneuvers of their own. And so the the bottom line is that you've got a lot of fairly isolated targets here that you can go after. And the, the Americans, as we're coming in, we do run into a cap. We we do yeah. run into a Japanese cap. This is over, I believe it's um, it's over A Force is is where we're primarily is now. Yeah, and that's yeah. of course the big girl. That's Zuikaku. That's right. Zuikaku is the biggest flight deck that got left to them at this point. Um, and so she's got a fairly substantial cap over her. The problem with smaller aircraft carriers is that they have problems defending themselves. And so if you look at some of the smaller ships in the inventory, like Chitose and Chiyoda. Um, you know, they probably don't have a lot of aircraft over them. Um, so yeah, the majority of the air, uh, opposition is actually going to be over a force and to a limited extent, uh, over B force because Junyo is still Junyo and Hio are both still operable at this point too. Bill, take us through this, uh, attack on a force by, uh, by some of these guys. Well, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the chosen target of the aircraft coming from Hornet, Yorktown, and Bataan. One of the pilots hailing from CV-12 was Hal Buell. Buell was one of the more experienced hell diver drivers in the air that evening. He'd seen quite a bit of action in 1942, as you said. Was it Santa Cruz? That he Was he at Santa Cruz? Um, Eastern Solomons. First flying, yeah. Yes, Eastern Solomons. First flying from Saratoga and later from Hornet and Enterprise. Coming in at 12,000 feet, Buell pushed over into a fury of Japanese AAA. His dive brakes had slowed his hell diver down to the point where he felt like he was falling in slow motion. That I can't feel good. Mm-hmm. Wanted to get out of the heavy AAA, he closed his dive brakes. That can't feel good either. Yeah. But the hell diver did drop like a rock at that point. But you're losing accuracy when you're doing that. That's the thing. I mean, the reason you've got those dive brakes, you want that low speed because that gives you the ability to compensate pitch and yaw so that your bomb is going to come down more accurately. Uh, I would say that's a rookie mistake, man. (laughs) You shouldn't. You shouldn't. Anyway, I'll get off this case. 
right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so fearing he wouldn't pull out of the dive, he hit the brakes again and the airplane slowed, allowing them to drop his bomb and pull out successfully. As he dropped his bomb, his aircraft took a heavy hit in the starboard wing route, I think, which sent shrapnel into his back and set the wing afire. So this is not a good situation he finds himself in. No. Um, and we'll hear more about Hal here in a little while. John, uh, the, the target of the attack is Zuikaku. Can you take this us through what happens to Zuikaku here? Yeah, this is actually the first occasion in the war where Zuikaku actually takes any appreciable damage. She's really been a lucky ship up until this point. And uh, she does end up taking a single bomb hit here, uh, which uh, ends up going through her flight deck and into the hangar, uh, busts a number of water mains, uh, which end up flooding down into the engineering spaces and, and sort of, frankly, freaks out the engineering staff to the point that they think that the ship is taking on uh, water. There is a, a pretty serious fire in the hangar decks. They have to deploy the, the foam firefighting system to, to quell it. Uh, but the net result is that they are effective in fighting that damage, and the engineering staff ends up realizing, oh, it's just our water mains that are flooding our spaces. So the there had been a, a a brief interval there where abandoned ship had been signaled, but that was very quickly countermanded by the bridge. And uh, by the end, uh, you know, within a couple hours or so, Zuikaku is is basically fine. He, uh, as is so often the case uh, when pilots from either side, Japanese or American, see a ship burning, they immediately are going to assume that the thing is done. Right. And by done, I mean sinking and or destroyed. And that's exactly what happens here. It, they see Zuikaku, they being obviously American naval aviators, see Zuikaku afire, or at the very least smoking heavily. And yep. they feel that, mm, yep, she, she's done for. Let's move on to something else. And, I, and we're going to talk yep. about this. And I have my own theory. And my theory, I'm going to assume, is probably the same theory that you have here, is that this is yep. a lack of experience of American naval aviators attacking warships. Right. And, and, and and some of this is also driven by the fact that, you know, in earlier war uh, battles, you know, a place like Midway. Yeah. If you set one of their carriers on fire, we know Japanese carriers have a tendency to burn. Um, but Japanese damage control is better by this point in the war. They have finally introduced uh, portable gas powered pumps. You know, sort of their version of the handy billy is now in service. And they have gotten more serious about their firefighting technique. And so uh, that, in combination with the fact that the Shoka Shokaku-class carriers were beautiful ships and very, yeah. very ruggedly built. They were, in my opinion, the best carriers the Japanese produced. So Zuikaku, you know, has got a fair amount of damage resistance just kind of baked into the cake. And in combination with better uh, damage control technique, you know, she's able to put her fires out pretty successfully. Yeah. I mean, look how many times Shikaku got hit, aside from Kavala, obviously. Yeah. Look how many times she got hit through the war and shrugged it. Well, I don't want to say shrugged it off, but survived all that. Made you know? it back. These are, yeah, They're beefy These vessels. are the, the Yorktown class versions of the, you know, uh, of For that sure. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're tough. They're harder yeah. than woodpecker lips. Harder than woodpecker lips. And if the Japanese had the money, you know, to build a few more of these things, they, you know, they would have gotten good usage out of them. The, the problem with with both of these ships were they, the engineering department on these things. I'm sorry, I'm getting into the weeds here. They had these beautiful propulsion plants, these big beefy plants, which were super expensive and hard to maintain and take care of, and so. You know, you, you couldn't necessarily spend, I forget how much these things cost, like 63 million yen back when that was real money. You know, they couldn't afford to build that many of them. And so they ended up, uh, for the late war carriers, they're using modified versions of the Hiryu class. Those are what's on the, the building ways at this point. Cheaper. Anyway, I digress. I was in, in, in April, and I think my McDonald's meal cost 63 million yen. But... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bill, anyway. take, take take us through the attack on B Force. What's going on over here now? Well, now they're get they're they're under attack from Yorktown, Bellwood, San Jacinto, Lexington, and Enterprise. And so, one of the that's right, five. five one carriers. of the first carriers to come under attack at this stage was Ryuho. She comes under attack from Yorktown's Avengers and successfully dodges at least 
five torpedoes dropped by VT-1. The remainder of VT-1 carrying bombs instead of torpedoes, we talked about that, make glide bombing runs on either Hiyo or Junyo. The American Avenger pilots optimistically claim at least five hits on glide bombing runs, which is remarkable. Um, but you couldn't find any record of either being hit, could you, John or not? Seth? Not, not by that, no. No. Yeah, Ryuho is a scow um, and is uh, structurally very suspect. This is her first and I think only uh, battle that she's going to be in. I don't think she comes along to Leyte. Um, but she is small and relatively handy and uh, manages to dodge all of the torpedoes that are aimed at her. So, yeah, nothing. Of what few there are. Right. And, you know, and it has been shown numerous times throughout the war that glide by American pilots, glide bombing attacks generally do not get you squat. It's garbage. And yeah. I know an Avenger is not a, not a dauntless or a hell diver. That's obvious, but I don't know. I, I, I question this. And this goes back to what we were saying earlier, you know, lack of preparation in terms of loading the proper ordnance that you need to complete this ship killing mission, which is what this is. Right. And to also lack of experience, attacking moving vessels yep. by American naval aviators. I'm not, you know, poo-pooing the, the talents here at all, but you got to remember what you had said. And what and my theory on this is exactly the same thing, is that they'd hit ships and truck. They'd hit ships and Rabal. None of these ships are moving. Yeah, right. Yeah. They're all yeah. sitting still. Yeah, I mean, th this is nothing to do with this battle, but I remember George H.W. Bush in an Avenger Glide bombing run at Chichi Jima, right? Wouldn't that be kind of, and that target wasn't moving. And so, yeah, um, yeah kind of remarkable that uh, we we're trying to use it against uh, moving warships. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, but it, it never results in a good thing here. Never, never get good results. Um, yeah. Closing in slowly, and I do mean slowly. On Heo, or what was probably Heo, one assumes was Ralph Weymouth's VB-16. We talked about Ralph Weymouth just briefly. We'll talk about him here. By the way, I'll put this in the notes, and I know, John, you're a bassist, and I know, Bill, you're a music fan. When I interviewed Ralph Weymouth, his daughter brought him to the World War II Museum. His daughter's name is Tina Weymouth, who is the bassist for the Talking Heads, which is freaking cool. <laughs> Does the Talking Heads even exist anymore? Oh, yeah. No, no, they don't. And in honor of Tina this morning, I have my trusty music man five string Stingray bass here because, I mean, I think it's arguable that one of the most important outcomes of the Battle of Philippine Sea is the formation of the talking heads. I mean, I think it's a different interpretational slant, but I think we may be able to go there. So, anyway. Well, hey, if, if Admiral Weymouth doesn't survive this battle, the there's talking no, heads are not no what they are. Heads. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, said differently, it might be the only good thing, not not to, to come out of the battle, <laughs> rather than the bad thing. Right. Yeah. Right. There you go. Anyway. Yeah. For sure. For sure. So he pulls in over B Force uh, with the SBDs from from VB sixteen. Uh, they're part of a coordinated strike. Not that not that the other attacks weren't, but this one is like really coordinated. Uh, the fighters of of which Alex Rashu is a part are there with the. Uh, with VB-16 and VT-16, and they're all flying as a pack of wolves. And sure enough, uh, the Dauntless, Daunt Lie, are at the lower altitude that you would not imagine, but I believe I had it in the notes. I didn't have it at the notes, but it, they were around twelve to 14,000 feet. They were, lo they were low. That's low. Lowest squadron in the group, and they get hit naturally by the Japanese Combat Air Patrol. Um, eight zeros jump Alex Frashu and his wingman, a guy named Homer Brockmeyer, uh, and in that attack, they are purely defensive, just trying to get away. The outnumbered Americans push low head for the water. Brockmeyer gets hit. His plane goes down. Uh, Vrashu chops throttle, climbs in behind the guy that shot down Brockmeyer, shoots him down, which is his seventh kill in two days, which is yeah. rather amazing. And then he gets the hell out of Dodge. Alex Alex gets a hell out of Dodge. And he... There's Lexington's air groups hit pretty, pretty hard here by some of these combat air patrol. And John, you were talking about this because the American losses over the Japanese fleet. 20 are aircraft. actually, yeah, yeah, it's almost as heavy as they were the day before. Yeah, not insignificant at all. You know, a combination of of having combat air patrol fighters 
um, and you know reasonably heavy anti-aircraft here in, in the later portion of the war. The one thing to note here, though, is <clears throat> you'll note that the majority of these intercepts by Japanese Zeros are occurring essentially over their flight decks. Yes. Um, that at this point in the war, even though these carriers are all equipped with radar now, they still do not view that radar set as anything more than a raid warning implement. Oh, bad guys are coming in. But the cap doctrine remains relatively consistent. You put these fighters up over the local vicinity of your carrier, and that's where they operate. So they're not pushing these dudes out. I mean, think what might have happened, you know, if, if the Japanese had actually had the ability to put 30, 40, 50 zeros out 50 miles into these American formations that are so low on gasoline, they can't even really f defend themselves. They could have extracted some fairly serious casualties from the Americans here, but they just don't have the technological and organizational ability to put all of those implements into uh, a package that will allow them to actually vector fighters to where they need to go. It's, it's pretty shocking when you think about it. It's, a, it's certainly the loss of an opportunity, that is, right. for... For darn sure, because it's not like yeah. you couldn't see this big ass strike coming for you. You know, I mean, there's right. a lot of airplanes what's coming Japanese, at you. What's the Japanese version of a turkey shoot? Um, They've never had it. Yeah, yeah. Mind. yeah. But, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, you could look at some of the early war battles uh, over places like Malaya. Um, a lot of those were actually fought by uh, by army fighters. Um, you know, flying. Uh, some of the early war uh, implements like the Hayabusa. But if you're going up against Brewster Buffaloes being uh, flown by British pilots who don't understand the how maneuverable those those um, planes are in the Japanese hands. Yeah, they, you know, had lopsided uh, kill totals. But those, you know, that's that's three years ago now. That's that's ancient history. Anyway, I digress again. So Weymouth's <laughs> rear seat gunner opens fire on attacking zeros as Weymouth pushes over in his dive. I said he dove from 12,000 feet. I was close. It was 11,500. Uh, firing at the zeros that followed them down, Weymouth's gunner forced the attackers off. Uh, the dive for Weymouth was hairy. As he told me, quote, the flak was heavy, inaccurate, but heavy. It was no bother, though. I had missed at Eastern Solomons, but I was determined to hit a carrier here, unquote, at 1,500 feet. And this guy, kind of like Hal Buell, he'd been flying a long time. You know, as I said, he was at Eastern Solomons. He flew at what he was at Guadalcanal. I mean, this guy flew a lot. At 1,500 feet, he drops his bomb and he pulls out. Um, he did not know which carrier he attacked. He came up with some name that, that wasn't even in the actual Japanese carrier inventory. But it is assumed that he attacked Hio because... His rear seat gunner said that the ship was unhit as yet, and he watched the bomb smack the island. And, John, she does take a hit near the superstructure, doesn't she? She does, yeah. Um, actually, both Hiyo and Junyo, uh, who are sister ships and look identical, and so, you know, Admiral Weymouth with, is within his rights not to know which of those two ships sure. he went after. Uh, they both end up taking hits uh, to the superstructure. In Junyo's case, she takes one or two bombs uh, in the island, which – demolish her her stack which is integral to the island and actually you know knock it over the side of the ship along with the main mast uh in Hio's case it's even worse she takes a bomb hit essentially right on the bridge which kills or wounds uh the majority of the personnel on the island uh including most of the senior officers um the ship's captain is badly wounded in his in his eye and like I say, most of the bridge staff is just scythed down by this particular hit. But yeah, both of these vessels end up taking uh, a bomb hit as a result of this attack. Um, other VB-16 SBDs shifted to Junyo. And how, how close were they? Do, do we know how close they were? Well, we uh, here's the only thing we know about this. Um, Hio is caught out of position. And this is the reason for her demise. She knows that this raid is coming in, and I think she knows that this raid is coming. In any case, she had pulled out of the formation to launch a pair of smokescreen aircraft, which I didn't even know were a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, she is now about 7,000 meters away from the main formation uh, and is very poorly shielded as a result of that. 
And this allows, uh, and, and she makes this launch, and as soon as she launches those two aircraft, lo and behold, here, you know, the Americans just sort of materialize over her in a coordinated bombing and torpedo attack against her. And this is this is the reason for her demise, is that one of those torpedo planes, um, there's an element, it, again, the accounts differ, it could have been either four or six come in against her, a number of them end up aborting their runs, but one of them, which is damaged, uh, and a fire ends up pressing his attack very, very closely, drops his fish, pulls up over Hio, and apparently goes into the drink, although that is up in the air as well. In any case, Hio ends up taking a fish in her starboard engine room. Uh, that is going to fairly shortly uh, disable her engines, and uh, she goes dead in the water. She does not appear that she's in any da great danger of sinking. But sometime after this, once again, uh, her aviation gasoline stores have been cracked. There's vapor and she suffers a catastrophic explosion. And later on in the evening, uh, down she goes with about 230 or 40 guys. Yeah. That a torpedo attack you're talking about, is it's assumed that it came from VT-24, which was from Bella Wood. USS okay. Bella Wood. Yeah. Uh, there's a guy, and and again, there's no consensus on this, but there's a lot of people seem to point to this one guy being Lieutenant George Brown from Bella Wood from VT-24. His torpedo um, attack, his, his airplane gets hit, and he, he splits his forces in that classic anvil attack on Hio. You know, they're coming in from both bows. Uh, right. He's approaching from the north, Brown is. Uh, he, like I said, his airplane gets hit. His two crewmen in the Avenger see the airplane afire, and they're like, "Nope," and they bail. They bail. Yeah, yeah. And Brown goes in by himself. Correct. And the the Japanese sources, at least you know the ones that that I was pulling off a combined fleet here, uh, seem to support the notion then that it was Brown that delivered this hit, which turns out to be the fatal hit to Hio. Yeah. Um, I'm intrigued, though, by the fact that apparently after this attack run, some of the Americans actually see Brown in his aircraft, and he at least uh, acknowledges their existence before apparently going in the drink. Exactly. There's a guy named, or was a guy, God bless him, named Warren Omark, who was from Brown Squadron from VT-24. And, and you got to remember now, the American aircraft are hitting the Japanese fleet right around sunset. So it's, you know a few minutes after sunset. So, I mean, it's, right. it's not pitch dark, but it's getting to that level. Yeah, we're, and, we're talking, we're in the 1730-ish range or a little bit after that. That's when these attacks are going down. One of, uh, this guy, Omar, pulls up alongside an Avenger that is, he said he noticed that there's only one guy in the Avenger, the, the crew ain't there. Right. And he says it was indeed Brown and Brown. He said he seemed like he was dazed, like, like basically, as he put it, um, he seemed stunned like a football player who had taken a hit to the head. It was getting dark and I lost sight of him. Apparently Brown raises up an arm to, I guess, to wave or to signal. And his arm is just covered in, in blood. And, and, you know, he's, he's very evident that he's been hit and somebody else. And I forget, I, I don't remember his name. Somebody else theoretically saw his airplane too. And then he was never seen again. Yeah. And uh, his two yeah, no, no. do bail. Go ahead, Bill. These guys that bailed in an adventure didn't have to climb up to get out. Um, so did, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure and that the, the. I mean the 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 radio man is in the the ventral turret down in the in bottom the tunnel, of that yeah. plane, and I don't right. know that there's an escape hatch in the in the belly of the beast or not, or if he's got to go out through the through the turret. I I I again, yeah, I'm not enough a, of an aircraft guy to to be able to tell you. At the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, they have an Avenger there, and that I, I remember that that the, to bail out, open the canopy, climbing up and out, and that's why Bush's crew, different battle, Chijijima, didn't get out because you know, he, they they couldn't climb out; they were apparently okay. injured. Okay, yeah. so didn't know that. So it's kind of, of ordered them to bail out, and um, because he he the pilot has to take action for them to do that, and so. Uh, that 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 is selfless, and that's kind of my point here. Yeah, that's interesting because both of those crewmen end up surviving the battle. 
Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Brown, yeah, Brown disappears. Have. Correct. hundred percent. So among the last of the attackers here that are coming in over B4, so the gas misers of, of Jig Dog Ramage's VB10, uh, as he approached, he could see a black. He could be. He could see black smoke coming from what he identified correctly as a Shokaku class carrier. Uh, obviously, this is going to be Zuikaku. He could see flak in the sky and what appeared to be a hell of a dogfight over that area. He said he steered clear of what he called "quote quite a fracas." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> He's like, I ain't going over there. He divided his squadron over B force and instructs his second division leader, a guy named Lou Bangs, to take the quote smaller jobs. King, as Mikey instructs his pilots, quote, 41 sniper to all bombers. The first division will dive on the largest CV. Other sec- other sections take the smaller jobs unless the big one is still not hit out. Boom. Quick, clear, done. He rolls over from 12,000 feet, and it is assumed here. And again, like you said, John, I mean, you know, nobody really knows because they looked exactly the same. It is assumed he dives on Junyo. He drops his bomb. He says he missed. His rear seat gunner, a guy named Dave Cauley, said he thought he hit. It was a near miss either way, and it was more than likely. Yeah. I mean, nobody knows, but it, he he could have been the height, the hit that buckled the flight deck. God knows, you know. Yeah, knows. exactly. I mean, she does take a couple hits all total, but yeah, I'm I am sorry, but I am unclear on the exact timing of those, yeah. and I will await the publication of my friend Tony Tully's book on this battle, you know, I'm sure we'll get the skinny at that point, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the bottom line is that he sinks and Junyo takes relatively significant damage, not sufficient to put her out of the battle. And her firefighting is fairly decent too, but yeah, you can, you can see photos of her after the battle and uh, she definitely got her hair pretty must. Tore up. Yeah, yeah. She's pretty tore up. Um, what about the other guys? Uh, Chitose, Chiyota, they come under attack too, but it's nothing. They do come under attack again. These two are are small, handy little light carriers that are very maneuverable, very hard to hit. Um, Chitose comes off scot free. Chioda does get nailed by a single bomb, uh, which kills about twenty guys and and takes out a couple of aircraft. But it's it's nothing serious. Uh, you know, a small fire that is in, uh, extinguished relatively rapidly. So. In the grand scheme of things, they get off relatively scot free. So the the attack unfolds pretty quickly, even though the attackers are the Americans are kind of strung out in different groups, as we've said. By you know, shortly after it begins, it's over, and the guys, the Americans, turn around and head for the mobile fl- or head head for the mobile fleet. They head away from the mobile fleet and head back to Task Force Fifty Eight. Bill, take us through some of the drama that unfolds next. Oh. <clears throat> By now, many of the aircraft had been damaged. Some pilots and crewmen had been wounded. All of the aircraft were low on fuel with 200 miles to go to fly home, to get home in the now growing darkness. So, of course, kicking the mixtures to lean, and that's kind of scary, too, because that causes your engine to run rough, right? And you wonder, is it going to die? Is it going to stall? The engine stall, not the airplane stall. The pilots tried to milk every drop of gas they could to get home. Hardest hit in the gas tanks were the hell divers. The fuel hogs had sucked up the juice, and of the 51 launched, 43 departed the mobile fleet relatively intact, and 32 either splashed or crashed at sea. 32 out of 51 either splashed or crashed at sea, yet the older, supposedly obsolete SBDs chugged along all the way back home. So this is not going good. And there's a lot of flying still to be done, Seth. Yeah. Oh, goodness, yes. Goodness, yeah, yeah. On the way back, um, a lot of the guys tried to regroup into their own squadrons, and some of them did. But by and large, these guys are like, I, I can't spare the gasoline. To, yeah, uh, uh, right. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and they're hauling ass. Well, I say hauling ass. They're getting out as fast as they can, you know, in decent order. Some guys do tag in, and some squadrons do actually – coalesce into one jig dog ramages vb10 is actually one of those he gets everybody together and they go home as a unit uh, vb16 mm-hmm. does the same and they're dauntless um but a lot of the other airplanes goes in onesie twosies you know maybe three or four and that's it um as they're going and getting closer and closer theoretically to the american fleet some of these guys are starting to put down 
uh, I find it interesting that some of them put down in, in, in larger groups, you know, they're putting down in threes and fours and fives yep. because they feel that there are strength in numbers. And it makes perfect sense. You know, you're Absolutely. more likely to see 10 guys as opposed to two. So I yep. mean, they're going to, you know, they're going to do that. However, and, and there just are others being in the water as well. If you've got a larger group of men, you know, if you've got somebody uh, who's injured or whatever, you have that many more people to help take care of them. And there is safety in numbers here. Uh, you mm -hmm. see the same thing happen at, at Midway as well. Uh, you know, some of the groups coming back from those strikes as well ended up going in the water together uh, just because because of that very human reaction that there is safety in numbers. For sure. For sure. As they're getting closer to the American fleet, uh, we talked about this one time, I think. American aircraft would have what's called a YEZB homing device. Zed Baker and homing device, yeah, and and what it does essentially is the aircraft carrier puts out a tone, and and the the ZB picks up on that tone, and as long as the, they're flying in the correct, and I'm really oversimplifying this, but as long as they're flying in the general direction of that tone, the tone right. gets stronger, and it tells you, hey, you're getting closer to home, right. and that's exactly what starts to happen here. Uh, the YEZBs are starting to chirp. Uh, as I put it in the note, the birds are getting closer to the nest, and that is very, very true. And while salvation is only a horizon away, for some it was still too far. Um, I said that one of the squadrons that that got into a cohesive group was uh, was bombing ten. Uh, Jig Ramage said that on the way home, radio discipline, as he said, quote, went all to hell on the way sure. home. There were guys crying, bawling over the radio, saying they weren't going to make it tell my mom I love her and all this kind of stuff. It was sickening. I turned my radio off, didn't want to hear it. I was bringing my boys home and I had to concentrate. on Right. Me. And that, that was a common thing that, you know, you hear a lot of the survivors say that, you know, there were guys that they knew that they were losing it because they're like, I'm not going to make it. And whether they were hit or not, you know, they, yeah. they were, they were starting to panic as we say. By the way, this homing beacon that they're, they're, they're homing on, uh, in modern, you, you, well, I assume they still do it. We have something called non-directional beacon or NDB approach to shore-based air, uh, airfields. And I failed my first instrument flying check ride by failing my NDB approach. So this is still non-trivial. It sounds, oh, wow, wonderful. You got a beacon on the aircraft car carrier, easy to find your you know, runway. Yeah, not so much. I can not tell so you much. it's more complicated than yeah. it sounds. Well, the other thing is, too, that you have to be above the, the radar horizon in order for this thing to work. If you're too low down, you're not going to catch that signal. And so well, particularly in, in the case of those uh, of the torpedo aircraft or in some cases, the, the dive bombers as well, you come down out of your dive, you're now at deck level again. Do I make the decision to waste the gasoline to get back up to altitude? to get to that better cruising altitude, which also will give me longer range on the Zed Baker to make my way home. Or do I think I'm better off just hugging the deck and not burning that gasoline to get up to altitude? Again, there's all sorts of trade-offs here and we're now in pitch darkness. Mm -hmm. Alex Rashu is flying all by himself and it's by around 1830 that he sees the lights and let's talk about these lights this is one of the most famous instances of the entire war not just pacific war but war mark mitcher had a plan theoretically mark mitcher had a plan to get his boys back home he actually separates or disperses the carriers in a wider formation to make it easier for the guys to find them but the whole story of the lights bill take us through the story of the lights yeah, so a similar thing happened during the rescue of USS Indianapolis in 1945. But, you know, Admiral Mitchell, to his credit, told everybody, turn your lights on. And the only reason you're going to be willing to do this is if you think you think you're you're willing to risk the submarine threat. Because that's is, what this really This is mm -hmm. just hair raisingly dangerous when you think about yes. this, because Japanese, you know fleet boats are designed to kill enemy carriers and they certainly demonstrated an ability to do that earlier in the war the wasp is is testament to that fact so yeah this this is not a trivial decision on mitcher's part at all mm -mm. no no but these white beams of light going up and if there's clouds they bounce they illuminate the clouds which makes it even easier to see yep. these beams of light initially confused race to 
thought he had headed towards Yap Island and was bound for his for a POW camp. Because remember, Yap was still held by the Japanese at this point. As he neared the lights, quickly became apparent where the light was coming from. John, you were going to say something? No, I was going to say, and Yap, yeah, Yap is one of those islands that gets cut off and and left on the on the the string. You know, we never do capture it until the after the war is over. So it, it's just an interesting yeah. testament to the fact that you know Vrashu is a is a marvelous pilot, obviously, but again, here in the pitch darkness, you he knows I could have gotten turned around. You know, do I trust my instruments? Did I actually head on the heading that I was right? You know, it's just it's really really hairy. It's it's yeah. very hairy. And the, the <laughs> way Mitcher orders these lights to be turned on, I mean, basically he calls in the clear. This is Blue Jacket himself. Mm-hmm. Today we'd say this is Blue Jacket actual. Turn on the lights to all the ships in the task force. So right. you've got all these ships in task force 58 illuminating themselves and the night sky for returning aviators. So the destroyers fired star shells, carriers lit up the night with their searchlights and deck lights. Battleships stab the sky with star shells and searchlights, all beckoning the boys home, Seth. And to any Japanese submarine in the area saying, shoot Here we are. Me, shoot me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Here we are, guys. Yeah. He's uh, Alex Rashu is relieved when he does see the source of the lights. He realizes that he is indeed over Task Force 58. Uh, he recognizes enterprises uh distinctive silhouette in the night and knows that lexington is nearby um he winds up getting a call as as does everybody by the way which is land on any base in other words don't even try and land on your home care just just if it's a deck put it down right and that's that's essentially what happens all over the fleet a half hour later because we talked about and again this is interesting most of the hellcats that are coming in here the 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 corvettes of the fleet uh, of the air of the air are coming in with more gas than are the dive bombers and the torpedo bombers and i mean i guess you could attribute that to the fact that most of the dive bombers are carrying a thousand pounders so they're carrying more weight and they're carrying an extra human being but still the fact that the hellcats actually could orbit and let the dive bombers and the torpedo bombers land before they did is the same i mean yeah yeah, it really is it really is a lot of them too were flying at higher altitude both out and back probably so in any case, right. that's also very. I didn't think of that. Yeah, but that's a hundred percent true because they're going to be up there trying to protect the flock. Blind cap. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Not cap, but escort. Yeah. Escort. So one of the guys that we talked about earlier. This is a very very tragic incident, but unfortunately, it's not the only time this happens this night. Uh, Hal Buell. He's uh, from Hornet, from USS Hornet. He nurses his SB two C back to the fleet. We said that his airplane got hit. Bill, you'd said that his airplane got hit by AAA. Uh, the right flap, his right r- wing flap had just been shot away and his back was bleeding from the shrapnel wound that he had suffered. As he approached what turned out to be Lexington, uh, Buell receives a wave off. Uh, it's unclear if he was too low or too high or what. Nobody knows. But he received a wave off. He ignores that wave off. And because he had literally, as he said to me later, I had no gas. There was right. nothing okay. left in the tank. Yeah, I'm running on fumes at this point. It's now or never. You got to put this yeah. bird down. I don't yeah, care what is, the LSO says. Exactly. There is no making a second pass. This is the only pass I have to make. What he does is when he hits the deck, he actually misses the wire and jumps the barrier. And his hell diver tears into the rear end of another hell diver and kills, unfortunately, the rear seat gunner in that airplane. Um, The guys, uh, the gentleman's name was Winifred Redman, who was killed by Buell's airplane. Flying debris also killed a sailor walking along a catwalk on Lexington. So this is a horribly tragic event. Yeah, think about that. You made it all the way back. And in the last 10 feet, you put, yeah, uh, a horizontal stabilizer into the turret of your own plane and you kill your crewman. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. it's 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 a bad situation. Buell knew he hit something, but he didn't know what had happened. He gets out of the airplane and he's bleeding, you know, because he's he's hit. He gets out of the airplane and he looks at this wreck in front of him and he says, "What is that?" And the sailor, who is obviously irate, says, "That's the guy you just killed." Right. And Buell loses it and hits the flight deck, and they actually bring him up to flag country. Because this closes the deck of Lexington too at this point, right? Which is not what so you not need. only 
no, not only does he kill two guys, unfortunately, the deck is closed and now there's other people behind me that can't get in because you just you just did this. So he he's dragged up to flag country and Arlie Burke and Gus Widhelm just tear into him. I mean, just light him up. And at this and he's wounded too, keep in mind. And at this point, Mark Mitcher walks in and says, gentlemen, that's that's enough. Let the lieutenant go below. That's enough. You know, and Mitchell's not stupid. He's like, this guy's going to have to live with this the rest of his life. You're yeah. not doing anybody mm-hmm. any favors right now. Let the man go get his wounds tended to, and we'll deal with this later. And that's exactly Yeah, I, I do have to say this is re- remarkably uncharitable on the part of uh, both Widom and, and Burke. Uh, and I think it's just sort of a testament to just how incredibly tense everybody is at this point. Everybody is, you know, absolutely on a knife's edge in terms of yes. their tempers. Um, yeah. because yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, Buell's going to beat himself up, uh, over that for the rest of his life. Yeah, absolutely. And, and he did. And he did. Yeah. Um, orbiting his squadron above the big E is my boy, Jig Dog Ramage. Uh, he found his ship's deck closed. Uh, and the reason for this is, is that actually they landed, uh, I can't remember his first name, but the LSO's gentleman named Prolix, he landed two F6F simultaneously, not his fault. Both F6S, he only saw one, but two yeah. F6S are coming alongside each other, and they both landed at the same friggin' time. And they had to clear the damn deck and, and they shut Enterprise's flight deck down. Wow. Yeah. You boy, you know How that. How is that even tight. possible? And, and did, did both the guys make it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Both guys made it, and they're both We're sitting down. there, you know, maybe not next to each other, but damn close, and they have to shut the flight deck down. What are you going to say? Yeah. I thought they collided and there was some damage maybe, to the planes. They, did. But, they may have. Yeah. They may have. But the part um, I, I've never heard that incident before. Yeah, that, that brings a new meaning to hair raising. Boy, well, I don't even kidding. have any hair, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Well played. So heading for any flight deck now, he just, Ramage tells everybody, he's like, just, just go. Just, just go land. He winds up landing on, uh, Jig does, on Yorktown on CV-10. Um, and it's important to note that, and we'll get back to this in a minute, that VB-10 got all of their boys home. Every That's single amazing. one. Uh-huh. That's crazy. Yep. They all landed all over the place. I mean, they were all over the damn fleet, but right. they all got landed. Every, yeah. No, it's every remarkable. One them, every one of them. And so I think uh, uh, um, VB-16 got, I think they lost two, but they actually lost two aircraft in combat like mm-hmm. they didn't run on a fuel they they were damaged and they went down uh, but anyhow uh, ramage runs into a guy that that if you've listened to our enterprise episode you know uncle john cromlin uh, aboard yorktown and john. uncle john yep. uncle john he says cromlin says quote you guys hit him pretty good tonight jig retorted quote i don't think so captain these reports you're getting are very exaggerated i think we got two carriers out there not four and in turn he was kind of half right they indeed did kill Ohio, and uh but that was it yeah guys let's uh let's wrap this sucker up what happens after after the attack ozawa is like nope we're gone goodbye right i mean he yeah he, it's it's later on than that evening actually when admiral uh toyota uh commander in chief of Com- uh, combined fleet gets on the radio and says we're done we're going home you know so continue retreating uh, as expeditiously as you already are, and, and this battle is is over. Um, the final butcher's bill for the Japanese as a result of this uh, particular engagement. So, yeah, Ozawa brought out nine aircraft carriers and 435 aircraft, and he loses three of those carriers, all of them uh, large flight decks and 297 airplanes and 3,800 sailors. Um, So sort of put that into perspective, uh, and there's another 200 land-based aircraft that get uh, destroyed in the course of this engagement uh, as well. So, you know, the total damage is is edging up towards 500 aircraft written off the Japanese inventory in the course of Mm. just a few days. Um, It's difficult to pin down the exact personnel losses, but Jim Sarek was able to give me an answer on that. And uh, in terms of carrier aviators alone, 
the Japanese lose 468 carrier aviators. And to help put that into perspective, if you look at the carrier battles in 1942, Midway, they lost 110. The worst of the lot was Santa Cruz with 143. But Philippine Sea by itself is equal to all four of the carrier battles in 42. Coral Sea, Midway, Eastern Sauls, and Santa Cruz with an extra Eastern Solomons thrown in just for good measure. That exactly equals 468 aviators. So, you know, in the course of, you've, you've spent a year and a half to try to reconstitute this carrier aviation unit, and you lose two thirds of those aviators in the course of a day and a half, okay? So this is just an absolutely shocking uh, total to be subtracting from Japan's pilot corps. And then you throw in the land-based losses, probably around 250 aviators in that mob as well. You know, the grand total is you're inching up here on about 700 uh, aviators of all flavors lost uh, during this engagement. Meanwhile, the, on the American side, uh, they've lost 123 aircraft, 76 aviators, and a total of 109 men when you throw the sailors in there as well. So in terms of aviator uh, fatalities, the Americans killed basically 10 for one. And that's that's almost all Phil C, right? Not Mission Beyond Darkness. Yeah. Both- well, the losses on the American side, of course, are heavily uh, mission beyond- towards Mission to Beyond Darkness. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So let's let's put this all in perspective. You know, we we talked about. I mean, the 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 kill ratio is ridiculous, and obviously that's a victory. I'm not saying that this isn't a victory at all. I'm just saying the strike that occurs on the evening of the 20th is less than stellar. When you send out 200 and what did I say? 240 aircraft, which again, in the, in the scale of 1942 battles, that's an unearthly large force. Um, So yeah, uh, again, I I keep using Midway because that's the only thing I know. Um, You know, the grand total of dive bombers that do in Kido Butai at the 1020 dive bomber attack is, you know, something on the order of 48 or thereabouts. Um, So, yeah, 240 aircraft go in and they can only manage to sink one carrier and put damage on two others. That's pretty lean, I got to say. You know, by 1942 standards, if, if you had sent 240 planes out, I would have expected to sink every single one of those Japanese carriers or at least the majority of them instead of just, you know, sinking one. So not a great showing. No, I agree. And and this 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 goes back to my theory earlier that I discussed at the or just touched on at the end of last week. And then again, the day is that these guys that did not while they were superb pilots, there's no questioning this. They did not have that ship killing experience that the guys of 1942 did. Yeah. And I'm not just talking midway. I'm talking like Enterprise Air Group, you know, at uh, Marshall Islands raid, all the hit and run raids. And then you got Yorktown's Air Group at Coral Sea. These guys are seeing a lot of warship combat yeah. actions. And, you know, of course, that all comes to fruition at Midway. And then and then you got you got Eastern Solomons and you got Santa Cruz. And they're, they're, they're seeing a lot of ship killing missions. These cats that are. I guess you could say maybe are the third wave of American pilots coming in. Never seen they any have, of this stuff. They haven't seen they, any of that. They've been trained by the guys from 42. Yeah. You know, a lot of those dudes went back as cadre and mm-hmm. were being used in training billets. But yeah, to your point, a lot of these gentlemen had not seen the elephant yet, at least in terms of ship, ship to ship or anti-ship warfare. Right. But, or moving ship warfare. Yeah. I mean, you, right. You know, and that's the that's the key. You know, you, you, you touched on yeah. it, the navigation aspect of it. That's a big part of it. Yeah. And, and then I mean, just just hitting the friggin target. Yeah. And, you know, we talked about different different altitudes that these dive bombers are coming in at the ones at Midway, at least Enterprise, Air, they're coming in between 18000 feet. And, you know, they're they're way up there. They're way up there. And, and so the standard doctrine of what you're doing is when you sight the, the fleet, yeah, you're coming in at 18, 19,000 feet, you're going to ease down into a shallow uh, dive to pick up airspeed 
And then your pushover is going to be, you know, somewhere between 14, 15, something like that. That's when you're actually going to go down on the target. But yeah, some a lot of these guys are coming in too low. Uh, some of that may have been driven by fuel constraints on the way out. I don't know. Or they just, yeah, they just hadn't ever flown this kind of mission before. And they just weren't all that good at it. Because again, the results uh, certainly reflect that. Yeah. And, and, and when we get to Lady Golf and, and all the battles that are part of Lady Golf, you see some of the same kind of results and some of the actions against some of these Japanese ship formations. You know, there's, yeah. there's, I forget which, um, which target they attack is if it's Sharita, I, I don't remember now, but, but Hancock sends out, you know, USS Hancock sends out this huge strike to go get these Japanese ships twice and they don't hit anything either time. I mm. mean, like nothing. So, I mean, it's, it's, and then you get, you know, you get other positive results, but here, where this is the mission where you're going to sink the Japanese fleet. Yeah. Granted, don't... Japanese AA is slightly better um, sure. by 1944. Uh, you did have some local cap opposition overhead again. Um, but yeah, I, I, dis disappointing is the only is the only way to describe it. Yeah. And yeah. for a, a very heavy loss in terms of, of aircraft that end up going in the drink and, and aviators as well. You know, I mean, to this point in the war, we could make up those losses in, in terms right. of of not not that not that you want to just throw that away as a you know right. paltry number, but we could make up for these losses in terms of airplanes and people, for that matter. You know, I mean, and Mitcher does go out of his way to go get these guys, and a great maj majority of them are pulled from the water. I forget, I had the numbers here. Um, bear with me. Uh, yeah, 20, 20 were lost, eight, further 80 were lost theoretically on the way home due to damage or pilots getting lost or lack of fuel. Personnel lost. We already talked, 100, 100 were fished from the water on June 21st. 100 guys are pulled out of the water, and a further 60 are picked up in the following day. So 160 guys are pulled out of the water. That's 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 pretty significant, you know. I mean, yeah, that's, that's pretty significant, but still, still, well, it should. <laughs> I do want to make this point, Seth, that, you know, Nimitz's doctrine of calculated risk was still in effect when this went down. Mm -hmm. And I said earlier that I think Eddie Admiral would have made the same decision as Mitcher going in, um, because I believe that they didn't believe that their carriers were vulnerable. They knew that the aircraft were, but I don't think they believed that this was going to result in a threat to our carriers. And you know, in modern terms, we don't we don't talk in, about calculated risk. We talk about operational risk management, but it's effectively the same thing. Right. And operational risk management, or ORM, is the abbreviation, is consequence times probability. And I think you know, I, I come at it from an approach of um, twenty twenty hindsight. I would say, what lessons can be learned, and what can we teach ourselves? Of, what can we do differently if we're to do it all, all over again? And in this case, I think they realize they should have known that the probability of losing a significant amount of aircraft was high because of two factors: oh, yeah. night and range. Yeah, night and range. Fact, late to make this a high risk mission for the aircraft, and so the probability high, consequence high. If they lose enough airplanes that it causes the Saipan operation, which isn't decided at this point, right? Mm -hmm. To to be placed at risk, which is the strategic objective. Like you said earlier, their mission was not to sink the, the fleet. Their mission was to take Saipan. And I do believe 2020 hindsight argues that Mitchell let this get ahead. Now, remember, I alluded to this earlier, Mitcher is with Halsey at Leyte Golf. Mm -hmm. And how does, and the task force 38, I guess that's right, Leyte Golf, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, how does this affect the decision to go chasing that decoy force? And, you know, a lot to, to so my, my point here is, I don't think they learn much from this battle. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe that's, that's just a, well, I don't think they do. yeah, and so I mean, from an immediate standpoint, of course, Spruance takes a tremendous amount of heat uh, for the yes. engagement as a whole, um, mm -hmm. and 
you know, people like Mitcher and Jocko Clark are just, they're bitter about the losses that they end up taking in the course of this somewhat inconsequential, you know, final strike and, you know, are making the argument, well, if you just let us slip the leashes earlier, you know, we could have gone off and fought this battle and we never, and maybe, maybe not. Um, it's interesting though, Nimitz uh, backs up Spruant, King backs up Spruant, but it's also somewhat clear that Nimitz is disappointed in the results that end yes. up happening as a result yeah. of this. It's funny. I was just so I was just reading last night uh, Trent Hone's new biography Good of point. Nimitz. Yeah, and and came across this passage that um, Nimitz you know, make sure that he does not want a future opportunity of this nature to be missed. And so he issues instructions after this battle that say, in quote, uh, in case opportunity for destruction of major portion of the enemy fleet offers or can be created, such destruction becomes the primary task. In other words, I think deep in his soul, he wishes that Spruance perhaps would have slipped the leash a little bit earlier than he did, uh, maybe in the mid-afternoon of the 19th or something like that, to start pressing pressing his forces, uh, you know, after Ozawa. That said, I mean, it's, it's to your point, Bill, right on the money. Of these two commanders, Halsey and Spruance, it really is only Spruance who has the capability to put his actions within a larger strategic context and to recognize that the success of the overall operation, it's the land operation that is of fundamental importance here. That ability to create those bomber bases can materially affect the trajectory of this war. And winning a carrier battle is just a nice to have. Yeah. I'm going to make one footnote point before, because I think you've got some major closeout points to make, John. Yeah. I think I mentioned this before in the mid 90s, I escorted um, Arlie Burke to his last CNO conference. And escorted means I drove him around on a golf cart <laughs> and I got to um, speak to him as I was doing so. And I asked him two questions and, and this is sad, I'm afraid. First question I asked him was about the Battle of Philippine Sea and you know why um, they went after the carriers after the, vic the battle had essentially been won. And he said, I don't remember. Yeah. And, then this, and then he asked me, I didn't ask him a second question. He asked me, when was I CNO again? Oh, no. And that's when, okay, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm not going to ask him more questions because it was so heartbreaking. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that so sticks with me. So, you know, it's, and I don't want to talk about Lady Gulf now because that's a whole other yeah, it's a whole fish other to fry. Fish. But mm -hmm. the fact that you said that Nimitz adds that, that little clarification copy. point in there is exactly why William F. Halsey goes chasing Ozawa's carriers again. We'll yep. get to that in another episode. In another episode. But, yeah. But John, close us out with some of these sure. some of these big picture points. That, big that picture points. Make. Big picture point number one is that the Japanese carrier force is now permanently wrecked. Neutered. Um, yeah. You know, you went out with with nine carriers. You came back with uh, with six, and a couple of those are dinged up. You've lost two thirds of your aviators. Um, Japanese accounts say they have only 35 operational aircraft left in their hangars. I'm quite sure there were others in there that have been, you know, dinged up and battle damaged, but they, you know, this has just been a, a walkover. And at this point, you know, there's no possibility that you're going to be able to reconstitute this force within the likely time frame of this war. Yes, you still come home with probably about 250 carrier aviators, so you have some cadre left to rebuild with, but you ain't got the flight decks anymore. You don't have the gas to do the training. Um, the, the carriers that are on the ways or are about to be commissioned, you're not going to have the fuel to run them in any appreciable manner either. The, the bottom line is that the, the carrier Navy is done at this point, and the Japanese recognize that. They're going to have to put their money into other uh, other assets. 
uh, particularly things like uh, destroyers and submarines and increasingly uh, uh, suicide uh, craft or, or what they're going to be spending their money on in terms of building programs. Point number two, um, the loss at Phil C, and I, I think we alluded to this on the last episode, Phil C leads directly to the kamikaze. Um, you know, it just does not make any sense from a return on investment standpoint to spend a year and a half training a naval aviator and then to throw that guy's life away in the course of one or two combat sorties. It's just, it's ridiculous. It's asinine. And the Japanese recognize this, right, you know, very, very clearly that, you know, we've got to figure out some way to do more with less because we know our pilot uh, caliber is declining. What do we do with the existing stock of both human and material assets uh, to somehow generate combat results against the Americans? And the result of that, those mental deliberations is going to be the kamikazes. And we can talk about that in more detail later on. The third thing, I've always looked at Phil C. And even though the results were somewhat disappointing in terms of the, the air to surface strike at the end of this battle, this is really the first emergence, I guess I would say, of what we would look at as the true carrier task force that we now have this implement of large flight decks, excellent second generation aircraft, really good aviators, astonishing amounts of defensive firepower, and backed up by all of this logistical uh, prowess. It can keep this force at sea um, at very high operational tempos that the Japanese just can't even conceive of. This is the first time that this force has ever been used in um a, a ship to ship carrier battle in in history and it's it's just been tri tremendously vindicated um you know the, the results in terms of the air to air losses are like you know godzilla's foot coming down on bambi i mean it's just it's just crushing uh and and this is a this is a tremendously consequential uh happening on the world stage this carrier force eclipses what the Pearl Harbor Kido Butai was like, you know, Model T versus Cadillac in the same way that Kido Butai eclipsed what the British had pulled off with a single carrier at Taranto. Uh, it's just completely night and day. It's it's really revolutionary what the Americans have put together here. Mm -hmm. it, it is the force that winds up conquering. The, well, yeah. The, the Marines and the Army are what conquer the Pacific, but without the big blue fleet, it ain't happening. And it, it ain't happening. It is, yeah. it is an all-powerful force. Gentlemen, do you have anything else you want to throw in before we put a bow on the uh, Battle of the Philippine Sea? No, sir. I think that's a good <laughs> I think we're good. blathered long enough. <laughs> I think we're good. I think we're yeah. good. Lunch is well, calling. With that... Go ahead. <laughs> Lunch is calling. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is indeed. So with that, we want to thank you very much for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast wherever you receive your podcast. Give us a rating and review. We do appreciate it. If you want to see the video version of this, look us up on our YouTube channel called the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. Like and subscribe. If you have a question or a comment, send us an email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. Once again, my name is Seth Parrott, and I want to thank you very much for listening and or watching. John, Thank you for being with us in this forager extravaganza. Yeah. Yeah. Extravaganza. No, yes. Yeah. I really appreciate being here. Thanks so much for having me on. It's always a, always a pleasure. Yep. Yep. And we will have you on again soon. We'll talk about some other juicy topics. Bill, take us home. And I'm Bill Toady. See you again next week. <laughs>